Good day, everybody. I think today we're going to take the time to talk about the Blend Station. It's not windy and relatively sunny, and I'm mostly awake, so it's a decent time for filming. So, we need to answer the few classic questions. How is Blend Station? What is Blend Station? Why is Blend Station? And where is Blend Station? Well, the where is pretty easy. It's it's on the farm. It's right right in front of us, right here. The blend station is used to take different liquids from different tanks, as you can see there's a couple different tanks, and put them all together and put them into either the liquid cart for the air seeder, or to go and put them in the biological genocide machine, the sprayer, over there. So when we set all this up, we took the time and the money to invest in a pretty nice system because it has to perform two functions, that is for the seeder and the sprayer, so it is relatively elaborate and it was quite expensive. But it does everything I want it to do, and it has the capacity to do more things than I'm currently able to or need to do. So we're going to go over pretty quickly what exactly everything does here, how it works, and we might even show you how we fill the liquid cart with it. So first we're going to start with explaining what is in each of the tanks. Now we're letting the sun shine in here. This red tank is 10,000 US gallons, and we use it to hold water. That little black tank there is about 1,500 US gallons, and last year it held humic, and this year I put sulfur in it. The big green tank is 42,000 gallons, all of it there, and this year it held all of our nitrogen, which comes in UAN, most of our sulfur, which comes as ATS, and the appropriate amount of humic acid to buffer the salt toxicity so I can actually put it in the ground without killing my seed. If you want to know my thoughts on, how, on modern fertilizers and how they're actually kind of bad, please see the video titled, Our Soil Has a Crystal Meth Addiction. Moving on, this blue tank here, I uh, usually use to store my phosphorus, during the winter anyways, when it usually arrives. And then I get these swanky portable tanks from our local retailer, shout out to GMAX for being awesome. And I put my phos into them so that this tank is available to make soup in. It works really nicely to make soup, which is blending all my different ingredients together, because it has this nice scale in 1000 liters on the side, so I know how much is in it at all times, relatively accurately, and it can help me blend if I have a problem with any of my meters. There's another one of those little black tanks. Uh, again, last year it had humic in it, this year it had sulfur. I will maybe explain why it had sulfur, while there's also sulfur in here, shortly. So let's uh, walk around the back and see what the actual, all this stuff over here does. Before I get into what all of that stuff actually does, I missed a few tanks. You can see there's quite a few thousand liter totes sitting here. These had some extra FOSS in them because when I come to go spraying, I'm going to need some FOSS to put in with our in-crop herbicide. And all of our potash came in a liquid this year and it came in totes because there was not enough of it to justify putting on a truck and shipping out here. So we have a few totes of food. <laughs> On the other side, because literally from the blend station with the totes and that black tank over, we have all food on that side. Red tank, all these things are all food. All food, poison. And then I store boxes of poison in the shed. This is, hold on to your hats, this is glyphosate. Roundup, yes, we will talk about how I don't like this stuff in a video shortly. I need time to produce that. Anyways, yes, poison sits here, food sits over here. It all comes out the same hose, lots of water, forgives multitudes of sins. Okay, now we will talk about all of this. Okay, I want to make sure that I can't make any mistakes, so I set the, the station up so it's hard to make mistakes. So we have the water comes out of the red tank through yonder three inch hose, comes to a three-way valve on the inlet side of the pump. This valve allows uh, fluids in from either side and then goes out the middle. So if I take this handle and go over that side, Water comes in and then goes into the pump like so. But fertilizer from this side cannot come in. But if I take the handle and go over this way, fertilizer can come in and go into the pump, but it cannot go to the water and the water cannot come back to it. So it prevents me from being able to mix them when I don't want them mixed. It also makes it pretty easy. Fertilizer one side, water the other side. Kind of hard to screw that up. So then it comes out of the pump, follows this hose, goes into a 50 mesh strainer, 50 wires in one square inch. All fluid that I pump goes through that strainer to make sure that we're not plugging uh, nozzles on the sprayer or orifices on the liquid cart. But if you back up here, you'll see that we have a helix filter right here, but we also have a bypasser we can go around it right here. The helix filter is 130 micron. Think very, 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 very small. And that's because the nozzles on the sprayer over there are also very, 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 very small. And I don't like to have them plugged by little tiny grains of sand and, and things you can barely see. But liquid fertilizer is actually quite thick and heavy and doesn't flow through really tiny spaces that well. So all of the fertilizer goes like this. I open that valve and it goes around the helix and goes on through. And the sprayer water goes through the strainer 
and then goes through the helix and then goes into the sprayer. And that way I can get adequate filtration for whichever job I'm doing without having too much filtration for other jobs. And now we move on to the expensive, super complicated, and most excellent part of this whole operation, and that is our chem handler. We have a Pattison Inductor Flex, and believe it or not, they actually let me help name this thing, and I have, I think we were the first person to take our delivery of our machine. So that's pretty cool. Quick shout out to Pattison uh, Liquid Systems. They're a pretty awesome group of guys to deal with. They have freaking everything and most spectacular customer service. Hopefully we'll get to do a video on them later because they're another small town Saskatchewan business. But anyway, so what this Inductor Flex can do is, well, an awfully lot of things. Water comes in from this side right here, goes through our three inch flow meter here, I'll talk about those in a minute, and can either go straight through the machine and out the discharge hose, or you can shut the bypass here and then the water has to flow through the venturi, which is down here. If you don't know what a venturi is, you should look it up. Venturi, it's it's phonetical, it's spelled how it sounds. You should look up how they work. It's pretty cool, it uses pressure to create a vacuum. And we use that to suck up fluids. Anyways, so stuff can go through the venturi, which can then induct or suck up a multitude of fluids before being discharged out the side. So our induction options inside this swanky tank here, we have a knife. We use this to smash jugs. Now by smashing jugs, we actually don't have to come in contact with the chemicals at all. We don't have to open the lids, take off the little tin foil caps. We just literally go and the bottom of the jug blows open. There's a rinse nozzle in there and you can keep your hands dry and you wear gloves if you really need to, but you can keep your hands dry while dumping chemical jugs. You can also add water through this little spout right here, which causes a big circulation to happen so we can mix dry powders. There's an anti, um, ugh, lost the term. It prevents it from swirling in the bottom so it doesn't suck air. It keeps it from spinning around in a big circle. There's a rinse nozzle on the side over there and the, no the valve to run the jug rinse is right there. So that's what we can do in the tank. It holds a lot, uh, 225 liters to be exact. You probably can't read that, but I can, which is pretty handy. I've never needed to use it to its full capacity, but it's pretty nice that it can hold that much. Just a couple more nozzles to run things here. This is the rinse nozzle that's in there and that uh, nozzle that I said you could put a lot of water in, that's tank flush. And then we have the wash hose, which I have hooked up to this swanky nozzle here because for some reason you always need to rinse things off, sometimes including yourself, just things splash. So the venturi on the bottom, there's a three-way valve again where water can come in from, or liquid can come in from either side and then discharges out the top. So right now we look at this swanky diagram and so it is in the tote draw position, this valve here. So that means that fluid follows this hose and it comes back up to this three-way valve here. And that way liquid can either come from the two-inch line, which I have, if you want to follow that, will go back to the totes or to the black tanks, or comes through the one-inch manifold here out the two tote draw lines, which are these ones here. I currently only have one hose hooked up. If you follow that hose, you will find it goes into a barrel of poison. So I said I would talk about the meters, so let's talk about the meters. These are probably the most expensive part of these. This one is a three inch meter and they're just literally like a thousand dollars an inch, which is mind boggling, but they are self calibrating, which means they will measure any liquid that's not a petroleum based product and they will self calibrate and they are stupid heckin freaking accurate, which is awesome. This meter right here, when I pump 64,000 liters of four different products into that tank over there is within about 200 liters on that volume across different products with different viscosities, different densities, and it figures it out itself. Pretty cool. They do not have buttons, they have little photo cells, which means that sometimes when the sun is just right or isn't just right or it's kind of dark, they don't work super duper well. This meter is fairly well behaved, but the two inch one over here gets called dirty words sometimes. I have to use the flashlight on my phone and then glove to cover the, the light because it's uh, my finger doesn't block all of it. This one's really picky. I don't like this one, but they do work really, really well once you get them turned on and they were definitely worth what we ended up having to spend on them. So yonder discharge hose here has a three inch female cam lock on the end and we have this set up. It hooks up to the back of the liquid cart. It hooks up to the uh, truck over there with a tank in it for hauling liquid out to the field for either the sprayer or for the liquid cart here. And it also hooks up to a valve on the side of the genocide machine. So this means that one machine over here with one hose can do all three of the jobs that I might need it to do very, very easily. 
Now we didn't talk too much about the pump itself. We opted for an electric pump simply because then there's no gas engine to have to check the oil on, put gas into, have a choke or a carburetor that's all plugged up to run out of gas while you're in the middle of doing something. So we opted for an electric motor. Now this has been absolutely fantastic because it is a little bit more powerful than a gas engine and you just simply turn on a switch and it does pump things. The problem is, is our local power grid is experiencing lots of troubles and we've been down a couple times this year where we weren't able to pump liquid for like all day, which we were able to get away with because our liquid tank is a lot taller than our liquid cart. We were just able to fill by gravity and when the power came on for an hour, we were able to figure out things to make it work. So, so far, electric pump has been super duper awesome. I don't think I would trade it for a gas one, but if I absolutely have to, I can patch a gas pump in, in place of the electric one, if say we're down for a few days, but I should just get a generator set up to run the farm instead. Now, some of you with eagle eyes might be going, Tyler, why do you have a compressed air line entering your liquid system? Well, that is a compressed air line. We'll follow it over to a gas powered air compressor. We haven't gotten uh, an electric one in the, sh the shed here yet. So why we have an air compressor here is because when we're all done filling, that whole big hose is full of stuff that weighs like 12 pounds per gallon and is worth like $5 a gallon. So I don't want to waste it. I don't want it to get all over me. I don't want to just pour it out on the ground. So if you actually use compressed air, you can blow out the line till the line is empty and clean and dry in a very, very short amount of time. So that's what we use it for there. We also use it in another place, and I will show you that shortly. So when you're mixing multiple products together, it is always a good idea to mix them again before you pull them out. So when we have this tank right full of stuff, you can imagine there's a lot of stuff in there and there's a lot of distance for things to fractionally separate. So if you can introduce compressed air to the bottom of a liquid tank, that air moves a lot of liquid as it goes up to try to reach the top. Now, when liquid goes up to reach the top, it also comes towards us across the bottom and then away from us across the top. And after a few minutes, the whole freaking tank is doing circles and it's literally kind of jumping and vibrating on the ground thoroughly and adequately mixed in only a couple of minutes. You can mix them by pumping out of the bottom and pumping back into this fitting because it actually is on a 90 degree and points that way inside so it can swirl the whole tank. But air does that job in a small fraction of the time. I've committed a violation last night. I left my valves open. <sighs> That's bad. That's why we have lots of valves. That way nothing can get out and go anywhere. I believe that concludes the show and tell portion of the blend station. So I'm now going to try and find a place to prop this phone up and show you how we fill the liquid cart. Okay, I stirred the liquid tank and I hooked up the hose, so let's fill this. Start at the front. Hook up the valve. Open the valve. No, I have not had coffee yet today. Open the valve, just check all the way along. Bypass is closed. Sorry, bypass, yes. Bypass is open. Helix is closed, that's it. Three-way to the fertilizer side, and because I forgot to close those other valves last night, we are flowing. Now we shall turn it on and you won't be able to hear anything. I can use those two gauges to check and see if either of the two filters is plugging. They're strategically located to allow such. Liquid is gargling in. It's kind of hard to see. You can see splashing there, but it actually ends up landing about here. It's coming in with fairly significant force. We're moving in at just shy of 300 gallons a minute, so it will not take long to fill this. So I may have lied. The tour is not finished. We're inside the chem shed now. There's a lot of things to see in here. I keep all the spare parts we could possibly need for the blend station. Adapters galore. Some of them aren't here, but I can pretty much adapt any size to any size and male to female. And you know, this is the LGD, the alphabet community version of farming. Anyways, I keep everything I might need for the sprayer and seeder in here when it comes to liquid handling stuff. With my nice swanky gloves that I use, the jack all that, that I, I don't I don't use as uh, dangerous. Um, that little binder keeps my paperwork in order so I know what I'm blending and I can write it all down so I know what I blended for certain fields. Some more gloves, extra fittings because you can never have too many of them. Lots of sensors and stuff for sprayers. And we have some stuff for killing grasshoppers. It's probably older than I am. We have some of our old blend station from my dad set up power box to run the pump and soon an air compressor and here are some very different varieties of poison and also some good stuff. The pail and that bag are, are good stuff but everything else in here not good stuff. Those two things are fantastic. If you farm and don't have either of those things you should get those things. One's a vacuum, one's a grease gun. 
if you don't have those, I, I recommend you get those. This building is pretty cool. Actually, my great grandpa, um, he actually had a small hardware store when he finished his service to the country in World War II as a radio man, I believe, in bombers. That was pretty cool. This was his propane shed at said hardware store. And that switch on the wall over there actually turned on the propane pump. There was a scale, I believe, right there. And so in here is where he did his propane retail for a business. So this building is like, no, three times older than I am. Maybe not quite that. But anyways, it's very old. It's been moved a couple times. It's in pretty rough shape, but it does this job beautifully because it has most of a roof on it. So it keeps most of the rain out. And it has a door that we can actually lock. So believe it or not, this building, and it's also up off the ground, which is a thing. This building actually is very close to meeting all the actual proper regulations that nobody cares about. So that's kind of cool. Uh, there's a plug-in for the blend station so I can unplug it and take the whole thing and put it in the shed for the winter. And I think that we have enough in the cart, so let's go and turn that off. The cart is not full, you will notice, which is fine. I have 40 acres to do south of the house to finish a field. And then I can move up to my parents' place about three miles away to do 280 acres. So um, I'm going to have to come by the yard anyways. So then I might as well fill again while I'm here. I'm going to have to, so why bother carrying all the extra weight around when I don't have to? Okay, supply valves are closed. Three-way is closed. The air compressor is still charged up because I had just uh, stirred the tank. Oh, this should be fun with one hand. How strong are your fingers? Okay, hooked up. So now we turn on the line. We pick it up just to help push things along. Hear the gurgling? Close the valve. I would do the only running that I do nowadays. Turn off that. And then I'm really lazy. And rather than venting back out of that port and possibly spilling some on the ground, I just release all the pressure into the uh, bottom of the induction tank. Then I just induct it on the next batch. Okay. So the line should be mostly clean. We should be able to unhook it. There's a little tiny bit of pressure left in there. There we go. See? Line's empty. Doesn't make dribbles everywhere. Doesn't get anything on my hands. Doesn't waste any stuff. Now I can tuck it back over here. Like so. And then I can uh, take liquid card of the way and pull the sprayer up to fill it if I want to. So that is the blend station in its entirety and its function. If you have any questions about anything you've seen here, please uh, drop me a line, telegram, comments, whatever. Get a hold of me, let me know. And let me know what you want to see in future videos. Because as much as there's a billion things to talk about here, I kind of don't know what orders to do. My videos will continue to be low quality like this for a little while until I have some more magical time show up that I can actually sit at a computer and do proper editing and such. Thanks for watching. I know this is a long one. I will see you all again next time.